Hello YouTube. So in this video, I want to talk about self-refutation. Um, so it's a common strategy in philosophy when arguing against an opponent to try to show that the opponent's position is self-refuting, where a theory is self-refuting if it entails its own falsehood, right? So um, the theory is false by its own lights. Um, uh, this is as I said, you know, it's a pretty common strategy, it comes up in all sorts of different contexts. Uh, one very famous example of this is with respect to relativism about truth. Uh, I am a relativist about truth, and perhaps the, you know, the, the, the oldest, the classic argument against relativism about truth is that it is self-refuting. Uh, if you are a relativist about truth, so the objection goes, then you have to grant that from the perspective of the absolutist, from the perspective of the person who rejects relativism, um, relativism is false. Right? So like from the absolutist's perspective, absolutism is true and relativism is false. Um, but if you're a relativist about truth, then you have to grant that the absolutist's perspective is true. You know, so like absolutism is true from the absolutist's perspective. So from the absolutist's perspective, relativism is false. And, um, you know, there's, and like that perspective is just as legitimate as my perspective. So uh, relativism about truth entails that relativism about truth is false. Um, I mean, that's, that's a very simple way of putting the argument. Hopefully that was clear. Um, I have discussed that argument in much more detail in uh, in other videos, and I will link a video in the comments where I discuss the self-refutation objection. Um, but um, but yeah, like the, uh, the the general idea then is that okay, um, if you affirm relativism about truth, you're going to be committed to the conclusion that relativism about truth is false. So relativism about truth is self-refuting, uh, and there are many other positions that have been you know, accused of, of self-refutation, uh, eliminative materialism, for example. Eliminative materialists deny the existence of beliefs and desires, um, but if you assert eliminative materialism, if you assert that there are no beliefs and desires, well, that's only a genuine assertion if you really believe that there are no beliefs and desires. But of course, if you believe that there are no beliefs and desires, then that means that your statement that there are no beliefs and desires is false, <laughs> because that is itself a belief. Um, so it's self-refuting um, in, in, in some sense, right? Like the, the act of asserting it um, would show it to be false. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, like this problem of self-refutation crops up uh, in all sorts of places. Um, now, generally speaking, I tend to think that self-refutation arguments are pretty weak. Um, I So generally speaking... Um, I think that theories which are accused of being self-refuting are not actually self-refuting. Uh, and, you know, I mean, uh, again, I've <coughs> I've argued with respect to relativism about truth, for instance, that uh, it actually isn't self-refuting. So see that earlier video. Um, but uh, let's say that the self-refutation argument was successful. OK, so suppose that somebody was able to show that a position that I hold is in fact self-refuting. Suppose you could show that relativism about truth is in fact self-refuting. Should I then give up on relativism? Um, I don't think that's so obvious. So like, I mean, what is it that's actually shown by by self-refutation, right? What, like, what's the problem with self-refutation? Well, I take it the problem is, is that if a position is self-refuting, then then we know that that position must be false, right? Because the truth of the position would entail its own falsehood. So it's like, the, well, okay, the position can't be true because, because, because the position itself entails its own falsehood. So, all right, if a position is self-refuting, then it must be false. Um, okay, so does that mean we have to give up on the position? Well, I'm not so sure for a few reasons. I mean, obviously, I grant that the vast majority of philosophers, and I would include myself in this, in some sense, we we want to discover what's true, right? Like we want to we want to come up with true theories, right? So so yes, I mean, in some sense, it's a problem um, if a theory is shown to be false. But I, I think there's a just a so there's a couple of reasons why um, we might continue to endorse a theory even when it has been shown to be false, even when it has been shown to be self-refuting. So the first point is, is that I think that a lot of philosophers these days 
have, you know, recognised that the truth, the complete, perfect truth, is not really available to us. And that actually approximate truth is good enough. So, I mean, this comes up most commonly when we think about like the sciences, when we think about scientific theories and scientific modelling. In the sciences, it doesn't seem like we have any, even like there's even the prospect of achieving, you know, the complete and perfect truth about reality. Even if you're a scientific realist, you know, even if you're very optimistic about the, um, <clears throat> you know, about the epistemic status of science, um, you're not going to get like, the complete true theory or the complete true model. What you're going to get is approximate truth. And I mean, one reason for this is because, you know, when we come up with a model of anything, um, we have to simplify. Uh, uh, so if I'm modeling the sun, for example, uh, it, it, it's like far too complex to represent it completely perfectly. The model must simplify. Um, but of course, if I'm going to simplify, uh, that means that I'm going to distort. I'm going to leave some things out. Um, my representation of, of the sun is going to be, in some ways, imperfect. So, OK, I can, say, I can say true things about the sun, but I'm probably not going to say, you know, the complete truth. I'm probably not going to say, I'm, well, uh, yeah, I'm not going to be saying the complete truth. I'm not going to be giving the perfect truth. I'm going to be saying approximate truth. It's going to be close to the truth and hopefully we get closer and closer to the truth over time. That's the sort of view that a realist would have. So, okay, we don't have true theories, we have approximately true theories, but approximate truth is good enough. Um, but the thing is with approximate truth is that approximate truth isn't really truth. Approximate truth is a kind of falsehood. Um, so, I mean, like, yeah, so so actually when we when we say that the theory is approximately true, we're saying that it's false. It's not it's not tr it's, no, it's not true. Right. Um, it's it's wrong in various ways. It's false. So, OK, let's think about this then. If the goal is approximate truth, why would self-defeat matter? I mean, self -defeat, so so the fact that the theory is self-refuting, um, this shows us that a theory is false. So if relativism, say, is self-refuting, then this shows us that relativism is false. Um, but but that's compatible with it being approximately true. That's compatible, indeed, with it being closer to the truth than any of the alternatives. Um, so I think if you think about things in terms of approximate truth, it really isn't clear what would be wrong with just continuing to endorse a theory that has been shown to be self-refuting. Because all self all self refutation shows you is that the theory is false, but uh, you know if the goal is approximate truth, well, you know falsehood isn't really such a big deal. Um, I think that you know it's so, and and there may be reasons to think that um, that like even in that in philosophy as in the sciences, um, the most that we're going to get uh, is approximate truth rather than you know perfect truth. In the early years of analytic philosophy, there was this um, movement that was known as ideal language philosophy. And so <clears throat> the ideal language philosophers had this view where they said, you know, basically a lot of philosophical problems arise because uh, natural languages, like English, natural languages are kind of vague, imprecise, contradictory. Um, so, for example, um, you know, there are relatively simple sort of linguistic tools uh, that can generate contradictions. If a language contains a truth predicate and if it contains a capacity for self-referential statements, then you can construct the liar paradox, for instance. This statement is false. Uh, this statement is false um, seems to be a contradiction. Um, similarly, uh, natural languages have all sorts of vague predicates that generate Sorites problems, Sorites paradoxes. Um, and so the thought is, well, the thought that the ideal language philosophers had was, you know, we can sort of take natural language and replace it, right? Like we should replace natural language with a kind of cleaned up ideal language. Um, you know, ideal language would be something that is explicitly constructed using precise predicates. It's constructed using classical logic. 
etc. So, and the, and the ideal language is a much more suitable tool for describing reality, for representing reality. So on this kind of view, the natural languages are the sort of, you know, they're the wrong tool for the job, right, as far as describing reality is concerned. Natural languages are vague, messy, inconsistent, but we deal with this by replacing natural language with, a, with, with an ideal, logically regimented language. But, okay, I mean, that's, and, that, and there's some plausibility to this, right? Like, I don't think that's a crazy position. But then, from that point of view, like, you sort of think, well, first of all, what if there can't be an, a perfect, a perfectly ideal language? I mean, maybe in principle, there couldn't be a perfect ideal language, or maybe just in practice, maybe because of the, you know, cognitive limitations of human beings, right? We're just never going to have a sort of perfect, ideal language. Um, it seems like we should at least be open to that possibility. So maybe, for instance, vagueness is never going to be completely removed. Or you know, maybe maybe if there, maybe there could be, in principle, an ideal language, but it would just be far too complex for human beings to use. So if the ideal language would have to have, like, I don't know, a name for each fundamental particle or something, um, and it would have to just describe things in literally the language of physics. Well, yeah, we're probably not going to get that, right? Um, so, um, okay, like, maybe an, maybe an ideal language is inaccessible. And, it, I mean, even if it is accessible, it's like, well, we don't have it right now, do we? Um, we do not currently have an ideal language for expressing everything we might want to express. Natural languages are more powerful at the moment. Um, so we express philosophical positions using natural languages. And then from this point of view, obviously these positions are going to turn out to be, strictly speaking, false, right? But if they're strictly speaking false, then it's not surprising that they might be self-refuting. It's like, well, yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, like, like maybe that's exactly what we should expect under these circumstances. And in fact, notice what I've just done here is articulate a position that is self-refuting. It's a position that entails its own falsehood, strictly speaking, because it is articulated in natural language, but natural languages are, per this position, inadequate for representing reality. Um, the, the most that I can hope for is that, well, <clears throat> maybe at some point in the future we might develop some uh, I ideal language that corresponds in some sense or is the mirror in some sense of this uh, position that I've used natural language to articulate. Um, uh, so, <clears throat> um, so, and, and there doesn't seem to be anything, again, like this doesn't seem like a, comp like a crazy position. It seems to me uh, like that's a sort of plausible view that, uh, or at least it's just as plausible as pretty much as many other philosophical views. Um, so, I mean, one, so one reason why I think these self-refutation arguments are maybe not so convincing is because, all right, we're not actually, it, it, maybe we are aiming for truth, but maybe we have to accept that approximate truth might be the best we can do. If approximate truth is the best we can do, then self-refutation is not going to, um, in itself, show that the position, that we should give up the position that we hold. Now, so this is sort of one way in which we might think that self-refutation isn't, isn't necessarily a problem. Another way, and this kind of is a bit more radical, um, it's a bit more of a radical break with traditional ways of thinking about philosophy. So what I've just suggested then is that, well, okay, there's this view where um, natural languages are um, kind of inadequate, but we can perhaps construct an ideal language that is adequate. But a, a more radical sort of position would say that language in general is not the right kind of tool for uh, understanding, comprehending, knowing reality, right? Um, so, like, there's this one view where natural languages are the, an inadequate tool for knowing reality, for really representing reality, so we construct an ideal language, but then you can, but then there's this more radical position which just says, well, actually, language in general, like, even an ideal language would be an inadequate tool for representing reality. Um, so the very, uh, the very tools of, like, language, propositions, reasoning, um, these are not going to you know, these are not going to sort of get you to uh, an understanding or to knowledge of 
what reality is. Um, so this is a sort of thing that you would find, um, you know, this, this is kind of perspective that, you know, you might find in, in more sort of mystical type traditions, um, or perhaps uh, kind of sceptical kind of, you know, like Peronian scepticism, that sort of, that sort of thing. Um, now, from this kind of point of view, um, you might say, well, in, you know, like, in the same way that a, uh, that a natural language theory might, like, be pointing at the, uh, the true ideal language theory, but natural language is all we've got. Similarly, okay, when we're doing philosophy, we have to do it in, you know, we do it using natural language, right? Um, maybe uh, truth is not, truth and propositions and language is not the right tool for representing reality at all. Even so, um, we might think that a philosophical position can kind of point in the right direction. Like it's, um, we can conceive of it as um, being something that's like setting you on a path uh, it points you in a direction and then you kind of have to walk that path and that's a path that's going to take you beyond um, take you beyond propositions um, so uh, you know like again if the theory is self-defeating or self-refuting well I mean that's just not a problem at all in fact that's actually kind of the point right like that would be an important feature of this theory insofar as it's it's a good pointer, right? Because what you don't want on this kind of approach, I mean, there's, there's, I guess it's like very broadly speaking, two different ways of approaching philosophy, right? There's two different ways of, uh, of, of doing philosophy. One way of doing it is to think that the point of philosophy is to construct stable positions. It's like philosophers build their little castles. You know, we build castles and then we defend them from all attacks. Um, so I have to actually construct, you know, build up this structure and then fortify it. And I sit in that structure and stay there and defend it, right? Like that's one way of thinking of philosophical positions. But the other way of thinking of philosophical positions is that, you know, it's more exploratory. It's like the position is, uh, is not the destination. It's not where you end. It's like just one step on, on the road, you know, and, um, uh, and so if you think that there might be something to the idea that, uh, you know, reality is, is, is fundamentally sort of non-linguistic or cannot be captured in linguistic terms, or that, uh, you know, reasoning isn't the right way to go to understand it, if you think that there's something to that, then uh, it looks like doing philosophy, philosophy, which is, of course, you know, linguistic, it's based on reasoning, it's propositional, all of this, um, the most that you can get from that is a good pointer, yeah, uh, a position that's like going to point you um, down a road. Uh, so, you know, uh, philosophy maybe is something that you can use to uh, guide you on, in some sense, on a journey, but, um, but that's all. Uh, and again, so from that point of view, um, it, it would be a good thing that the theory is self-refuting because it's not supposed to be, a philosophical position is not supposed to be something that you would um, kind of sit comfortably in, where you would, you'd like adopt the position and be like, well, yes, this is where I end. This is where it finishes. Um, I'm going to sort of fortify this position against all attacks. Uh, like, no, actually, you're supposed to leave the position. Um, I mean, this strikes me as, again, you know, this is... <clears throat> I, I, I don't know, that, that, that seems like a, a, a uh, plausible way of thinking about what philosophy might be doing. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, um, I think there are various reasons why um, we might not be completely convinced by the idea that um, self-refutation means that we have to abandon um, a theory or position. Um, so there you go, just some, some reflections on self-refutation.